This suburban neighborhood dwelling adult spent his childhood in rural settings. If I learned one thing about growing stuff, it's this. When you take care of your soil, you take care of your whole garden. Tilling the soil ensures that healthy things will grow from it, that new life will soon emerge. Jesus shares about this concept in his parable of the sower. He shares in Matthew chapter 13, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and they ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This story has always fascinated me. For the farmers in Jesus' day, listen, the rocks were their irrigation system. As the morning dew settled, it rolled off the sides of the rocks, and that little drink of water became sustenance for little seedlings. It gave each seed hydration to fuel new life. Jesus posed the problem, though. What happens to the seed that falls on those rocks? Well, for farmers in our day, by the way, according to Jesus' parable, if you are a Jesus follower, you're also a farmer. And farmers tell me, soil quality matters. The quality of the soil of our lives and of our church we desire is to be fertile soil so that new life can grow, so that we can be conduits of God's plan and God's grace. For 55 years, Venture has been a place where new life has grown from the soil of faithful people. From our earliest days, God has been faithful to allow our seeds to bear much fruit to advance His kingdom in our community and beyond. In the late 1960s, a handful of Northside families had a vision for a Carmel-based congregation patterned after the New Testament church. Their vision became reality as the congregation of Woodland Springs Christian Church was formed in 1968. Our first site was selected and construction began at 3405 East 116th Street. Our first services were held there in May of 1971. Then my friend Mark Wright accepted the invitation to become our senior pastor in 1989. That happened to be my freshman year of high school. The church flourished with new life and eventually outgrew the Woodland Springs building and moved a couple of miles north from 116th to, well, you know, at 146th and Hazeldell Parkway and soon became Hazeldell Christian Church. New life emerged in this move as well and the church experienced baptisms, mission outreach opportunities, and new families and individuals growing in the Lord. The church then became Venture Christian Church in 2018, and my family and I had the distinct privilege of joining this family as your new lead pastor. I quickly realized that this church is something special and that God continues to birth not just new names of this church over the years, but truly new life. Well, the time has come for us to till that soil once again and for new life to emerge. But what will it require of us? Getting rid of things that were special to me was very, very difficult. And God reminded me frequently, it's stuff. It's just stuff and you cannot take it with you. We didn't recognize it at the time, but I think God was nudging us and telling us, you know, hit the pause button on this. <laughs> yeah, I think wrestling with that has um, really made me process what I want to do for my kids and how, what example I want us to set for them.
I am reminded of the Apostle Paul's words to his apprentice Timothy in his first letter to him, chapter 6, let's pick up at verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, well, we will be content with that. Paul goes on to warn us of worldly temptations that will distract us on earth from the eternal purposes that he has for us. And then he goes on to say in verse 11, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. He says, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. See, the new life is the eternal life. A friend once said to me, if it doesn't matter for eternity, it doesn't matter. Venture family, I want to live a life that matters, a life that matters for eternity. And God is calling us as a church family into some exciting new ventures over the next couple of years. I want to be poised as a follower of Jesus to take hold of them and to make my life count. So we're aptly calling this new season of ministry, New Life. New Life is first and foremost what God seeks to do in us in this season. That is our primary goal, that God would till the soil of our lives, of our faith, of our generosity in ways that cause our lives to bear fruit that points more people to him. New Life is secondly about the mission God seeks to advance through venture. There are three components to it. The first is new life for others. Venture has long had a missions heart. I love that about our church. And we seek to raise that temperature of local and global missions. Locally, we seek to be a part of the solution to those families who are struggling to be able to afford daycare for their children. We want to put an emphasis on a mental health initiative to empower and equip each one of us to better serve one another in the mental health crisis. We plan to invest in a local partnership with an organization called Same As You and serve young adults with developmental disabilities to help them live the life that they imagine. Same As You is filling a need for more meaningful activities and programming that often stop when those students leave the school system. We want to provide an opportunity to our food pantry, our venture food pantry, to feed local families that are experiencing food insecurity today. We also desire to upgrade our outdoor space so that you can invite your one to come join you in our church backyard to play together. Have you ever stepped out back in our backyard? Could you envision what this space could be used for to minister to others? It's an amazing space. It's nearly an empty canvas. COVID taught me several things. One thing it taught me through our worship on the lawn gatherings when we offer a blank canvas to God, he's pretty good at filling in the brush strokes. I can envision a park-like setting out here, maybe pickleball or basketball or other inviting environments. How cool would it be to invest in some outdoor environments for you to host your one right here in our backyard? We believe that if they join us in the backyard, maybe you can intentionally encourage them to join us in the living room to meet the living God nationally. We desire to invest more in church planting through our partnership with Stadia and to even host a boot camp for church planters right here at Venture. Internationally, we plan to invest more deeply in our partnership in Honduras and to continue being God's hands and feet on international soil as well. Bottom line, we seek to bring new life to others in every way we can in this season. The second component is new life for generations. New Life for Generations is about enhancing and developing our outdoor children and student spaces through an outdoor patio gathering space and space to play. Things like sports courts for sand volleyball and basketball. We believe transformational conversations and new life can happen through these interactive environments. We also seek to launch an apprenticeship program for those who are looking to go into ministry 
so that we can continue to invest in the next generation in those ways as well. New Life for Generations is also about our debt relief and continuing to put us in a good position as a church to serve more generations far into the future. The third component of New Life is New Life for Venture. New Life for Venture includes our ministry fund budget. Some of you might think of this as our general ministry budget. But listen, it is anything but general. It's the lifeblood of what we do daily in ministry, and through New Life, we seek to do more ministry than ever before, as well as, well, we're gonna refresh our physical campus spaces in order to continue to be a welcoming presence to all who enter. So, join us on this journey. Let's embrace the new life, the eternal life, the life that doesn't consist in the things of earth, but a life that is focused on eternity. Let's discover what God might have for us as we embrace this new life together. Yes, that moment in the service a bit ago when Caleb led us to take a deep breath and let it out. I feel that all morning this morning. We've been praying about this moment for over a year now, gearing up for over a year now. I can't wait to see what God does over the next five weeks in us and through us. You heard me say in that video, a friend told me one time, if it doesn't matter for eternity, it just plain doesn't matter. I believe that to be true. Our goal for the next five weeks is to lift our gaze from the temporal to the eternal. And I hope you join together with us on this incredible journey. Speaking of journeys, what is a journey without a good guide? I'm going to invite, uh, we've got some ushers that are poised to hand your guide out to you. Uh, if you guys and gals would go ahead and start doing that. I want to encourage you, everybody in the room needs one of these. Uh, it's going to be your guide for the next five weeks. I'm going to encourage you to take it with you to your small group. I'm going I'm to encourage you to bring it back with you next Sunday morning. You're going to interact with this for the next five weeks. Speaking of interaction, could I just piggyback off of something you heard Chris say just a bit ago? So we had a QR code. We're going to put that back up on the screen right now. New Life Daily. Some of you are kind of accustomed, maybe in the habit, of a daily devotional, a daily quiet time with God. Maybe you're not accustomed to that. This would be a great time to give that a try. Actually, psychologists tell us it takes five or six weeks for you to create a new habit. Maybe you'd want to lean into a new habit over the next five weeks together as a church. So we're going to be, with your permission, texting you daily, a small prompt for you to pray through or you to study through, you to read through. We want you to opt in for this, though. We're not going to spam your text message with this if you don't invite it. So please opt in for it. Scan that QR code, fill out the little bit of paperwork there, and we'll send that to you beginning tomorrow. Hey, I want to talk through some of this guide, this uh, vision guide for you over the next five weeks. Uh, there are a few component, components that I want to call out specifically. First of all, the first several pages are vision pages. Some of you, you learn best through a video like that. Some of you, you really enjoy reading. I see you. If that's you, the, next, or the first several pages are for you. And uh, you're going to find some details there about the specific initiatives of New Life. You're going to find specific information there about the dollars associated with them. There's some other helpful tools. I hope you find them helpful in this generosity journey as well. Something that I want to point out. You heard it, you're getting ready to read it. Let me point it out to you as well uh, that our secondary goal is $7 million. Our primary goal is heart change. That's what we're leaning in on. The secondary goal, though, is $7 million. Take another deep breath. $7 million. Let that sink in. I, uh, I count it a privilege 
that God would allow us to steward such incredible kingdom resources. This is a huge initiative, and it's one that, in my opinion, is going to require faith unlike any other. To encourage you, though, uh, by God's grace, our current two-year giving pace is about $4 million over a two-year period. If we were to do nothing, if we didn't do anything with New Life, we would be aiming the next four years to do ministry through Venture Christian Church to the tune of $4 million. So we're looking to accelerate our two-year giving, giving from $4 million to seven. Million through this, uh, I did that. I, nope, nope. I got to do it that way. There you go. Seven million through this new life initiative. So our new life journey includes our normal two-year giving. I know some of you have questions about that. I wanted to underline that. Second, uh, if you're tracking along with this journey guide, you're going to find that there's a space in here for message notes. I'm going to invite you actually right now. Would you turn to page 23? That's where I'm going to invite you here in just a couple of minutes. You're going to take some notes. I know that some of you, you're accustomed to taking notes during the message. I love to look out and see people doing this or see people in our app doing the thing with their thumbs. I love it when I see that. Even if you're not a note taker, over the next five weeks, would you please lean into that? Because you're going to want to write some things down that are going to prompt your attention later in your small group or later in your own quiet time to go back to and reflect on. Um, there's some good stuff waiting for you there. Okay, the next thing I want to point out is that there is some group content in here. If you just turn the page over to page 24, you'll see that week one content for your small group is right here in this guide. Speaking of groups... If you're not in a group for this journey, can I just simply ask you, what are you waiting for? Run, don't walk when the service is done out here to the New Life Hub. Jake would love to get you signed up, get you connected with a group this week. The train is leaving the station, but get connected this week. Listen, you can go through this content on your own if you'd like, but life is meant to be lived in community, especially healthy church community. And this is a great way to do this. Our groups team has put together a great re, uh, group of resources for this season. You don't want to miss out on that opportunity. Okay, lastly, you found this commitment card tucked into the book. And uh, I want to give you one specific action step with this this week. We'll come back to it. Other weeks, I'll explain more from this commitment card. But this week, I'm going to encourage you to simply pray would you pray, begin to pray about how God would have you respond? So put this in a special place when you get home. Maybe put it on your nightstand, tuck it into your Bible, maybe sit it next to your toothbrush, wherever you're going to see it on a daily basis and remind you, call you to pray about what expanded generosity in this new life season is going to look like for you and look like for your household over the next several weeks and into the season that we're stepping into. Then, on Sunday, November 19th, we're going to have the opportunity as a church to commit to generosity together for the next two years on our very special church-wide commitment Sunday. Mark your calendars. Don't miss that. November 19th, there will be a specific action step that day with these. But between now and then, would you, uh, would you be praying? Use this as an opportunity to pray. Okay, speaking of pray, prayer, I want to pray, and then we're going to dive into what God would teach us through his word today. Would you bow with me? Father, I feel like our church family is on the edge of an epic journey. Lord, as we pack the bags, as we gear up, as we prepare our hearts and our minds for the journey, we invite you to speak loudly clearly to our hearts and our minds today. Lord, we can't wait to see what you seek to do in us. And Lord, by your grace, what you would seek to do through us. It's in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Maybe you heard me say this in the video a bit ago. The quality of the soil determines the quality of the life. The quality of the soil determines the quality of the life. Listen, I have lived farm adjacent pretty much my entire life. 
not on the farm, you understand. My dad's a psychologist. My mom was a school teacher. I didn't grow up on a farm, but I did grow up farm adjacent. My adolescence, oh my goodness, we lived downwind of a hog farm. I'll give you just a minute to absorb the truth of that statement. Downwind, the prevailing wind came from the west. We were just a little bit northwest of that particular hog farm. When the wind came just a little bit out of the south, oh boy. Well, I guess I thought it smelled like money. So when I was about 15, I got on my bike and I pedaled down to the farm and I got myself a job. And I worked there all the way through high school and college. Seven years I worked on that hog farm, paid for Dawn's wedding ring, engagement ring, some of my college with that experience. Listen, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And oh, I've got some stories from the hog farm. I'll spare you those details today. If you go a few years before that, though, my childhood was spent farm adjacent. One of my earliest memories is on the tractor, a 1952 John Deere. They called it a Johnny Popper. Two-cylinder engine. My grandpa had that tra tractor. It was kind of rust green is how I remember it. And I remember spending time with my grandma and grandpa, and then later with my aunt and uncle. They also had a farm. I'd go for like a week at a time and spend time on the. It was a, a childhood's playground. One of my earliest memories is picking up these with my grandpa on that tractor. We'd drive the fence rows, and we'd stop, and I'd climb down off of his lap, or when I, a little bit later in life, I'd hang on to the back seat, stand on top of the PTO shaft, and I'd go and pick one of these up. Do you remember? Do any of you know what this is? They're prolific right now out in the Indiana woods. It's called, some of you would call it a what? A hedge apple, I heard that. Anybody call it something a little bit different? Osage orange. As a little child, I hear apple and I hear orange. And I think, oh yeah, I like both of those. And grandma and grandpa would say, no, 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 no. That's not for you to eat. It's fruit, kind of. My wife and I have a fun, little, I think it's fun, a little joke every fall. I go hunting. I pick these up in the woods. I bring them home. I put them in her kitchen. She does not laugh at it. They begin to rot. A few days later, she'll take it outside and throw it over the neighbor's fence. That's kind of what we do. And, uh, you know, generations from now, I, I suppose that there will be some hedge apples, some Osage orange trees growing across that fence line. Why? Because this is a kind of fruit. There's seeds inside of it. New life is meant to emerge from it. By the way, generosity, I've got some pictures of where I picked these up if you want to look at those. Generosity yields unexpected fruit. Generosity yields unexpected fruit. Hold on to that thought. I'm going to come to back, back to that here in just a minute. I want to pick up, though, where we left off in that video we just watched together. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning with verse 6, check this out. But godliness with contentment is great gain. This is what we wish for. This is what we desire. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. There are no U-Haul trailers behind the hearse. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And then skip ahead just a couple of verses to verse 7, I believe it is. Or actually, it's verse 18. Check this out. I love how Paul, speaking to young Timothy, whose job it was to pastor a group of people. My pastor's heart quickens a little bit when I read through this text in Scripture. He uses strong language here. This is why we have to teach on this topic. This is important. Paul tells Timothy, command them to do good. Okay. To be rich in good deeds. Okay. And to be generous and willing to share. Paul tells young Timothy, your job is to not encourage, not provoke, not nudge, but command them toward this topic of generosity. It's important. It was important then, 
In a culture that values consumerism as highly as it does in our culture, this is such an important series. Lean in. God has something to say to your heart. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves. He's quoting Jesus here as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Could I suggest to you, over the next five weeks, that's what we're aiming for. To take hold of new life. To take hold of the life that is truly life. Now, can I suggest to you, in order to do this, first, you have to do this. Especially those things that we cling to so tightly. They are things. And they threaten to drag us down. In order to take hold of that life, you have to do this first. This is the posture that we approach the text for the next five weeks. The title of today's message is The New Life is the Eternal Life. It is. This right here is a picture of eternity. By the way, in my opinion, my eternity began the moment I asked Jesus to be my Lord and my Savior. It might have even begun in those early days when my grandpa, likely driving around on the tractor, he was praying for my young heart. There were some seeds being planted then. I believe my eternity did not, does not begin one of these days when, oh, I get hit by a bus or maybe I'll die of old age of natural causes. But when I go to be with Jesus in the sweet by and by, that is not my eternity exclusively. It began when I asked him to be Lord and my Savior of my life. And so why in the world am I not living like I'm in my eternity today? Can I encourage you to write down a couple of questions? Discuss these with your small group later. Here's the first one. Am I living in new life? Have I embraced that idea that my eternity began when I asked Jesus to be my Lord and I invited him to be my Savior? I said, you're the boss. Command me how to live. That's what it means to be Lord, right? Am I living like that? Let me ask it a slightly different way. Am I living in my eternal life today? Only you can answer that question. But spend some time over the next five weeks processing those questions. Listen, as we go on this new life journey, we're going to be looking at two specific chapters in Scripture. Why? Well, because they contain the longest continuous teaching on the topic of generosity. If you want to turn there with me, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 for the next five weeks. You might even read those chapters on your own this next week in preparation. Today we're going to be looking at the very beginning of that discourse, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning with verse 1. What you're looking for as we tease out the text together. If you're taking notes, write these down. We're going to be looking at three rich statements that we're grabbing straight out of the text. But also, because I spent enough time farm adjacent, enough time with farmers to recognize they're fairly plain speak kind of people. For example, when I was working on that farm in high school, one of my first days there, my boss said, hey, I want you to take the tractor and go scrape the manure off of the lot at West Place. I, what? What did you say? West Place. Well, okay, now I figured out where it is and where I'm supposed to go, but it was like a week later I finally asked one of my coworkers, what is West Place? Well, he slowed it down and he said, it's literally west of place. They just kind of call it what it is. It's the location that's west of the original farmstead. So we call it what it is, west of place. All right. So plain truths, I've got three plain truths to help explain those three rich statements. Are you ready? Here we go. Let's read the text together. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace, big Christian word there, theological word, that God has given the Macedonian churches. Paul's writing to Corinth. We'll tease this out in later weeks. It's almost like he's writing to Indiana and he's saying those churches to the north up in Michigan, pay attention to the way they are living. He goes on to explain it. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty 
Oh, he's got my attention. What's he going to say next? Welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. They're models of generosity. We should pay attention to them. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded, isn't that interesting, with us for the privilege of sharing in this service of the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God's God's also to us. If you skip ahead to verse 7, it says this, but since, and now he's talking to the Corinthians, We've talked about the Macedonians and the fruit in their life that they have put on display. Now he's saying, and you, since you excel in everything, you're good at this. I see fruit in your life on display in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you. See that you also excel in this grace of giving. Grace of giving. Isn't that an interesting turn of phrase? The country boy has gone to the big city. This agrarian-based message of Jesus has now carried to an urban center. The metaphor, though, of growing stuff, it carries into the city. Three rich statements. If you're taking notes, write these down. Again, these are pulled straight out of the text. When you embrace the new life that Jesus has for you, You give yourself, first of all, to the Lord. You give yourself. Remember the posture? You give yourself, first of all, to the Lord. Where do you find this? Well, in verse 5, they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. My adulthood, I've spent farm adjacent as well. I might be the only guy in my neighborhood who has a gambrel and hoist in his garage and he knows how to use it. Some of you are like, what's that and what's that? Well, if I'm successful in the harvest of a deer, that's a tool I need in my garage. When the kids were little, the bus driver, this is genius because five of the kids climbing on the bus were our kids, and so they made the bus stop right in front of our house, bottom of our driveway. There was a moment, Dawn came running out just in time. One of our kids was punching in the code, and the garage doors going up, and she knew I had just been successful in a harvest of an animal. And all of the fresh, shiny faces of the kids on the bus, oh my goodness, it was Christmas time. Is that reindeer? Is that Rudolph? Oh boy, let's stop that right here. It didn't happen, thank goodness. I've grown up farm adjacent. Listen, part of me, part of me mourns the move of our culture from an agrarian-based culture to an urban-based culture. Not just because of what I enjoy doing on my day off, but I would wish upon my grandkids my experience I'm starting to mourn at the risk of sounding old. I'm starting to mourn an ever-increasing addiction to screens. I'm beginning to mourn that. I also mourn this as a Bible student because so much of the Bible is filled with agrarian-based metaphor and the context of Jesus' teaching. If you know a little bit about farm life, there's a richness there to pull out. But don't some of you in your soul, do some of you resonate with this as well? When you gather together with your small group later, discuss this. Do you feel this a little bit in your soul? There's something going on in our culture right now. They're saying it's not going to be too awful long before they're going to try to implant AI. Or there'll be an option for that, maybe even inside of your brain. We're walking around as cyborgs today. We all have one of these and we carry it in our pocket. And oh, by the way, we kind of lust after that, don't we? Did you hear that the new iPhone 15 has come out? I hear it's made out of titanium. Why? In the, my 13's not good enough. I need a 15 now, don't I? Does just a piece of you mourn that that we're experiencing? The ever-increasing drive for more, to buy, to cling. It threatens your soul. Jesus put it this way. Mark chapter 8. For what shall it profit a man? If he gain the whole world 
and lose his soul. We cling too tightly. It endangers our soul. Or what shall a man give? Let me ask it a different way. In exchange for his soul, what is your soul worth? Is it possible? There's some of this. This might be the most important series that you have ever engaged with. We're going to do some soul work. We're going to do some soil work. We're tilling the soil of our lives. What does it mean to give yourself, first of all, to the Lord? I told you there were three plain truths. Here's the first one. The root forecasts the fruit. You don't plant an Osage orange and expect to harvest a legit orange. You don't plant a hedge apple and expect to take a bite of, what do they call them, granny, delicious, something or other, I don't know, I love them, whatever they are, crisp. This time of year, those apples are awesome. You don't plant this and expect that. You harvest what you plant. Usually the root system forecasts whether you're taking a bite one of these days out of a juicy apple or a sweet grape or a tart cherry. For example, if you live for Black Friday, you miss out on the grace of giving that happens at Thanksgiving. You miss out on the good stuff that life is meant to be when we cling to the stuff that threatens to endanger our souls. Can we talk real quick about the theology of first? The theology of first. Jesus speaks of this in Matthew chapter 6. He says, but seek first in the Sermon on the Mount, his kingdom, do that first, and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be given to you as well. When you give yourself first of all to the Lord, it puts everything else into a new perspective. We're only four chapters into the Bible when we see first show up. There's Cain and Abel. You can hit that text yourself. And we see that Abel brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Hit the next slide. The Lord looked with favor on the theology of firsts. You need to ask the question for yourself, what is first for me? What am I planting in the soil of my life? Why in the world were the Macedonian churches able to give so generously in the midst of such extreme poverty? Might I suggest to you what they planted they were harvesting? We see the fruit of the Spirit on display in their lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, generous, and being generous and with self-control. Let me ask you this. How do you harvest self-control? How do you harvest that? Well, you don't plant greed. How do you harvest peace? Well, you don't plant consumerism. How do you harvest kindness and goodness? You don't plant keeping up with the Joneses and hoarding all of my stuff from the Joneses. The opposite of a theology of first is a theology of second. In other words, I'm terrified of living a second. This leads to a scarcity mentality. I have to keep. I have to gather. I have to hoard. How are the Macedonian churches able to give so generously in the evidence of such extreme poverty? It's because they gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord. Second rich statement. When you embrace the new life Jesus has for you, you plead that's a strong word, isn't it? You plead for the privilege to participate in it. Verse 4, it says it very clearly there. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Paul was encouraging the, these other believers in Corinth, and by the way, us today, to give like the Macedonian churches because they did it with such joy. We see joy on display there. They considered it a privilege to participate. Have you ever been at a dinner party and there's some appetizer that is so good, you just want everybody else to taste it as well? We were at a wedding not long ago and the mother of the groom was busy taking pictures. I gathered the plate and said, oh, you've got to try this. We want to make sure you, th these are good. By the way, usually the good thing is wrapped in bacon. This is how this works, right? I grew up on a hog farm. I can tell you with authority, after seven years, those are such vile creatures. It's one of God's 
greatest mysteries to me how such a vile creature can taste so good. And yet, it does. Bacon, I'm so grateful that Jesus redeemed the pig because it tastes so good. Three plain truths. Here you go. Fruit should taste good. Fruit should taste good. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Let me ask you this question. Does your one, does your coworker, does your neighbor, do they see your new life on display? Do they see generosity or do they see a stingy Pharisee? The fruit of your new life should be wrapped in bacon. It tastes good. By the way, it's meant to be shared. So here you go. If you're taking notes, here's the third rich statement. When you embrace the new life Jesus has for you, you seek to excel in everything, including the grace of giving. We see this in verse 7. Check it out. But since you excel in everything... By the way, this looks like fruit to me. Faith, speech, knowledge, earnestness, love. See that you also excel in the grace of giving. Fruit on display. Generosity is a fruit. Do you wrap giving into your own doctrine of grace? Three plain truths. Here's the third one. Fruit is is for sharing. Are you sharing it? Or is this the posture? You have to do this before you can cling to the new life, the eternal life. Can I amend a statement that I said earlier? I said this. I said the root forecasts the fruit. It does, usually. But this past week, I was watching some old home videos, and I saw an old home video of one of our little boys with great-grandma, and she had just passed away, and we were looking at one of the fruit trees that she had planted, and get this, it was an apple tree, and it had two or three different kinds of apples growing on it. Why? Because she grafted, as a master gardener, she grafted some branches onto that tree. Listen, you're stepping into this. I know what you're feeling right now. You're thinking, oh, I don't know. The preacher's talking about money. I don't know. What I have been planting, I don't know about the fruit that it's going to produce. Can I just say this? Jesus has a green thumb. He does. And his expertise is grafting. You could read about that if you want to study it a bit further. You could go to John chapter 15. He talks about being the true vine. He talks about the fact that the Father God is the gardener. And he talks with language there that reminds me of grafting. He wants us to abide, to remain in him, to graft ourselves into the root that he's building up into our lives. The next five weeks is a huge opportunity for us. What roots have you planted Have you been chasing the more, chasing the better, chasing the American way? Would you be willing over the next five weeks to do some of this in your life? And let the master gardener, who has a better green thumb than you have, graft you into his root system. Would you join us on this journey? Let's maximize the resources and the gifts that God has given us for full kingdom impact. Let's leverage the unique impact that we have here in Hamilton County and around the world in this slice of history. This is our time. This is our time. Over the next five weeks, we'll be taking a look at passages of Scripture that will strengthen our faith and challenge our assumptions. And my hope as your pastor is that we're going to come out of this season with a greater sense of grace, a greater sense of eternity for what God is asking to do in our lives, with our lives, with our resources, and with our very selves. We've been given a great opportunity to make an impact for Jesus on this earth in our one life we've been given to live. What are we going to do with it? I want to leave you with this thought. Sometimes generosity yields 
unexpected fruit. Sometimes generosity yields unexpected fruit. My earliest memory. My grandpa died when I was in fifth grade. Grandma died a few years later. My mom died my senior year of high school. The family farm went up for sale 10 or so years after that. By that point in time, I was married. We had some kids. We were right in the season of foster care, gearing up for adoption. We had like a little preschool living in our house, or five of them, little rugrats. I get a call from my uncle one day, and he says, listen, we have liquidated the family farm, and we wouldn't have to do this. (laughs) Your mom has passed. She's one of five kids. You're the oldest of four. We're going to split your mom's share between you four kids. One-twentieth of a small parcel. It wasn't a big farm. It wasn't a whole lot of money. But you understand, it was fuel It fueled generosity in a season of my life that we desperately needed that. Generosity yields unexpected fruit. My grandpa never got to meet those grandkids, great-grandkids of his. We got to adopt a whole crew of kids into our family. They were not his DNA, but oh my goodness, that generosity, it fueled our family, in the season when we desperately needed it. Sometimes generosity yields unexpected fruit. You have no idea what might, God might do through you as you do this, even generations into the future. Would you stand up with me? We have a song. This is going to be a bit of an anthem we're going to sing together for the next five weeks. I love the lyrics of this song. Pay attention to these lyrics. Before we sing it, though, would we commit this next five-week season to God in prayer? Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. God, we can't wait to see what you would do in us. As we open up your word, as we go to small groups, as we discuss, as we process, as we spend time in your word and respond from prompts through the New Life daily texts we're going to receive, Lord, would you begin to do a work in us? so that you can do a work through us. And it's in your name and Jesus' name we pray. Amen.